All right. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're still in Exodus. Go figure. Now, <laughs> now we're going to get into some area that some may say, this is boring, man, just more rules, more laws, more stuff. But what you're going to see is that, remember last week, right at the end, the God had orally expressed the Ten Commandments to the people. The people were all around. They received the law. But at the end of that, the uh, you know, there was lightning and thunders and everything like that. And the people ended up crying to Moses saying, don't let God talk to us, for we will die. You talk to us. So we're going to pick up where that left off. Now, when you think about the law, the law is all focused on those initial Ten Commandments. That's why we hear today about the Ten Commandments. You know, you don't hear about the whole law. There's like 630 actual established rules within the law that apply to the law. You can call all of it the law. And uh, But what you find is that these rules or regulations or standards that we're going to pick up with today apply back to the Ten Commandments. They apply to our relationship with God, how that's supposed to work. It applies to our relationships with one another, how that's supposed to work. It applies to child-parent relationships, how that's supposed to work. So when you think about that, you realize, oh, those are the three areas in the in the Ten Commandments that you see. You see the at the top of the Ten Commandments are the three commandments that really deal with fo you know following God explicitly, loving Him, not taking His name in vain, not having any other gods before Him. That is the standard. Then you get down to number five. And we are to honor our father and our mother. So that is a given so that your days may be long on the earth. And then we get into all the other commandments, you know, thou shalt not lie. Well, not, not bear false witness. We use that one as thou shalt not lie. Well, technically, same kind of thing. Um, you're not supposed to steal. You're not supposed to commit adultery. Um, you're not supposed to covet. You know what I'm talking about. So we get those others that are people oriented at the bottom of the Ten Commandments. Now, what God does is he pulls Moses aside since the people don't want to hear God tell them this. And God's now telling him all the specifics of what these break out to be, what the idiosyncrasies are. Now, some would ask, since the Ten Commandments are really, for the most part, a moral law, you know, we know that the one who gave them is God. So God is the moral law giver. And for all intents and purposes, we say, well, wait a minute. Is loving God a moral thing? No, it's actually a spiritual thing, isn't it? It's a it's a driven, heartfelt issue that we should have toward God. It's it's about the heart being turned over to God. So you can say, well, that's not a morality issue. And, and that's true. It's not in and of itself a morality issue. It is a surrender issue to God. It is about saying, hey, God, you are my God, and everything revolves around you. I need to have a relationship and a surrender to you. And so that's what the first three laws deal with, right? Is that relationship that we should have with God and how we are to treat God, how our, what our responsibility is toward him. Now, we all know that we all fall short of being perfect with our relationship with God. You know, even though in our hearts, I guarantee you that each and every one of us love God. We, we want to do what brings God honor and glory. We want to do what pleases God. But yet, you know what I'm talking about. We fail miserably. And I hate to say it every day. At some level, we think bad things. We think things we shouldn't think. We think things against our brother and sister. And when we're doing that, guess what we're doing? We're rebelling against God. 
because he's established what he wants us to do, but yet we still do things our own way. So in essence, we're not holding God as holy when we fall into these types of weaknesses or proclivities. And the writer of Hebrews, you know, once says, oh, that we would be re released from these sins that so easily beset us. In other words, those sins that, you know, for each of us, it's going to be different which sins beset us. You know, some people have problems in one area with their life in Christ, whereas others may not have a problem whatsoever in that area. They're able to walk righteously in that area, but they'll have different you know, sinful proclivities in a different area. And that's why we are so dependent on each other, because guess what? As 1 Corinthians 12 puts it, we're supposed to build each other up, be there for the common good to help one another. That's why the body of Christ is so important. It's not about trying to live a godly life on our own, because guess what? Who helps us when we fall into those areas that we have a specific proclivity to sin in? You know, if you, it would be helpful to have somebody that doesn't have that problem in their life to be a, there to help you to be able to get over that hump, you know? Well, that's the same way. Then we might have a strength where somebody else has a weakness and we can be there for them. Well, that's how the body of Christ is supposed to work. That's why the unity of the body of Christ is so important. And we don't do that well today. You know, we still have that problem of there's a lot of divisions amongst us. And you know how Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1 through 3, and on two occasions in those chapters, he says, let there be no divisions amongst you. Because divisions don't bring the unity that Christ wants in the body. So, the reason I bring these things up is because, did you know that even in the Hebrew people, God wanted a unity of his chosen people to represent who he was? As a matter of fact, they were supposed to go out and tell the rest of the world about their God and live within the righteousness of their God. And we know, I've, we've mentioned this before, they didn't do it. They stayed pretty much to themselves. And they wanted, you know, and they hated everybody else. Now, God does put, we'll see as we go through these regulations, God doesn't look at foreigners the same way we do, right? Or at least the same way the Hebrew people did. They, he saw them as potentials. And uh, so, I mean, these things are all important as we go through these rules. Now, think about them. As we go through all these commandments, what we need to understand is, you know, could we even keep one of them for heaven's sakes? You know, <laughs> and the answer is not so much. But the reason God put them there was to show them that they could not do it alone. They could not do it on their own. They needed help. And guess what? God knows even today that you and I need help. And that's why he had Jesus come. That's why the church became the body of Christ, because we are supposed to be able to help each other through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit to be able to build each other up to make us into a righteous organization. Like I said last week, it was never God's intent that we would have hundreds of Christian denominations out. That was never God's intent. God's intent was that we be one united body of Christ in the whole world, okay? And if the body of Christ were holy that way, guess what? You and I could travel to any country and be welcomed into that body of Christ as part of the family of Christ. Does that happen today? I don't know. Not so much. Not as much as it should, let's put it that way. But that's God's call on those who are his. That was God's call on the Hebrew people all the way back then, too. He wanted to have a relationship with the selected people, the chosen people that he had, and he wanted them to reflect him through what he was doing for them and through what they were reflecting to other people in the process. 
That's what he wants of us today. He's made it easier for us to be able to come into saving grace, but it still takes the individual to say, I need you, Lord. I want you to be Lord of my life. It's not just something that is passed down from your parents to your children. Well, hopefully they're witnessing to their children and the children then come to saving grace, but it's not something that is inherited by your parents or anything like that. It's not something that comes about because, you know, like the pastor says, I had a drug problem when I was a kid. My parents would drag me to church all the time, you know. Yeah, I know. Anyway, it, it's the past. Did you get it, Jeff? You look a little stunned on that one. <laughs> oh, you got it. <laughs> You're muted. You're muted. And I'm having trouble reading your lips. <laughs> 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 I uh I was in agreement with you. It is definitely not in, inherited. It is uh, you know, uh a an actual uh choice an individual must make to accept Jesus Christ as his or her personal savior. Absolutely. Yep. Now, that's not a hard thing, or at least you would think that's not a hard thing to do. But what you find is that man's heart, and I'm just talking human hearts, can be really, really hard, can't it? And some people, it's it's like climbing Mount Everest to get them to look to the Lord. And uh, other people, it's like as soon as you tell them, man, they fall on their knees and are crying and are repentant. You know, <clears throat> so, you know... I'll use the old adage, different strokes for different folks, but it still comes down to a surrender and saying, it's not my doing. Everything I need depends on you, Lord God, and I need you to be in my heart through your son, Jesus Christ, and I want him to be Lord of my life from now on, and I want to please you, Lord God, in doing what you would have me do. Not, not because I have to work for my salvation. That was a given by grace through faith, right? And so we know that that's how God gives his gift. But the person has to be surrendered to the Lord. As a matter of fact, on Wednesday, uh, the pastor is going to be talking about the parable of the sower. Remember that? What happens to the seed? Look at how many different types of situations happen in the parable of the sower where the seed falls. And the only seed that is of value is the seed that falls on the good ground, right? Because the seed that falls along the path gets eaten up by the birds. It produces nothing. You have the seed that falls on rocky ground where there's very light soil springs up, but since there's no root, dies away quickly. And then the other falls amongst thorns and it gets choked out. Um, when you look at things like that, I mean, Jesus explains those. So I'm not going to get into it here. But what you find is that the majority of where the seed falls does not produce, does not result in any kind of fruit, right? Only the seed that falls on the good soil results in fruit. And didn't Jesus say, wide is the road that leads to destruction? And how many find it? Many. Many there are who find it. But narrow is the path that leads to life everlasting. And how many find it? Few. Very few. And who's at the opening to that narrow path? Jesus, Jesus Christ, right? Because he is the only way of salvation. Yeah. So when you look at that, the reason I bring that up as a comparison and contrast between then and now, you know, the reality is God hasn't changed. It was the same for them. But they focused on something else. They focused on the law as a legalistic thing to follow God, not focused on the lawgiver. And that's where they failed. That's where they always fell short. That's why they had trouble coming into relationship with him because they could not tie, they could not bring it together to say, I need God to help me live out the laws that he has given. They tried to do it on their own. We see Jesus even condemned the Pharisees for doing that and even causing people to fall away because of the fact that they were 
you know, mounting burdens on the back of the people that they themselves wouldn't even keep. So you see, they got so focused on the law that they missed the whole picture to the one who loved them and wanted to be there for them and help them. And it's no different today. So, so any questions on the introduction? Because we're going to get into some areas now that some would say, well, it's pretty dry stuff. But it has merit and value because one of the things it causes us to do is look to the law giver. And guess what? Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. So in a sense, it goes back to that, but we don't go into a relationship with Jesus Christ so that we fall back into the law. What we do is we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ because he took the law into himself. He already paid and satisfied the law on your and my behalf. Did you know that? Yeah. That's what he did. That's why you and I don't live by the law. We live by our relationship with Jesus Christ and trust him in that. Not trying to live the law, but living in him, asking for his strength and ability through his Holy Spirit to overcome any of these issues that we deal with in the flesh. And I'll tell you, he's there for you. If you really ask him to, he will be there for you in all those situations. Good? Yeah. Good. Okay. Not a question, but yeah, go ahead. A comment. Um God appears a lot, you know, as a cloud or smoke or fire, but up on that mountain it was thunder and lightning, and somebody was blowing a trumpet. So the people were <laughs> shaking in their boots saying, Moses, <laughs> you go talk for us. And the other thing is that Moses wasn't afraid. I don't know who was blowing the trumpet, but um, I just found that interesting. Hey, when Jesus uh, Gabriel, returned, of course. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Gabriel, I was going to say Gabriel, of course. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, he could have been. But notice this, Gene. What is it that happens just before Jesus comes back? I mean, like within seconds of his coming back. Trumpet. Trump shall sound. A trumpet is blown. I mean, the oh. sound of the... I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when when you look about, uh, you know, that, I mean, and what does a trumpet do? Wakes people up. Okay. And it's a command, too. Don't they use trumpet to, you know, um, uh, give signals to their army? Things, what to do, it says. And what is Jesus coming back as this time? Is it a cloud? No. No, judge. what's his role? Yeah. What's the role he's going to fill when he comes back this next time? Judge. Really? Judge and king, right? Yeah. So he, it's the trumpet of the kingdom coming. It's the part of the prayer at the very beginning of the Lord's prayer. Prayer. What is it that Jesus asked for us to pray to the Father? Thy kingdom come. That's what it was all about. The trumpet is ushering in his kingdom uh, it's the blowing it's the heavenly trumpet blowing the coming of the lord jesus christ and his kingdom on earth where he will rule with an iron fist right this time he's not coming as the suffering servant he's coming as a righteous king to rule over all mankind he, over the whole earth notice it's not just the united states <laughs> It's over the whole earth. In other words, he is supplanting the Antichrist, who was filled by yeah. Satan at the point where <gasps> Jesus returns. So that's what we're looking at is Jesus to come and the, the trumpet is ushering him in. So the trumpet is a symbol or a sign of God's presence when when God sounds the trumpet. Cool. Oh. Yeah, it is. It's it's a it's a pretty cool thing when you look at how it worked there. And that's what God was ushering in was he was ushering in his law, his presence, his oh. rule over his chosen people with the trumpet there. And we can see the corollary in the end when Jesus comes back to rule. It's it's a pretty interesting picture how some of these things just tie together when you look at some idiosyncrasies that that carry over you know, in the different ages, in the age to come, so to speak. So when he returns with his trumpet, the saved people 
will be yes, and the unsaved people will be scared like the. <laughs> oh yeah, that they'll, they'll run into caves and ask the caves to fall down on them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, will they repent? No. They will still flip their nose at them. Hmm. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're looking at to come. And we can see that there's a lot more apathy today for the church than there was 40 years ago. You know, because think about it. We, we can see how much we've really fallen away as a nation from God. I mean, when you think about, you know, what's our pledge? One nation under God, indivisible, right? Yeah. Yet now <clears throat> you can't really say that with any kind of solidity anymore. Yeah, so it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. Yes. Okay, so we ready to get into the minutia of God's direction and guidance and importance of each individual item? Yeah. 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 Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. We praise you that you were always with us. We thank you that you've always cared for humankind. As you've said it with by, by your Apostle Peter, you wish that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yet, man, we can be stubborn, can't we, Lord? And, you know, what's really sad, Lord, is that your way is right. I mean, it's not for us to say what is right because we're fallen we've got we've got a character that is totally antithetical to you our hearts would not be anything towards you if it wasn't for you drawing us to yourself so lord please help us in that and also teach us what you would have us know about your wonder and how you really did want the best for the hebrew people but yet they just they 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 followed wrongly I mean, yeah, there were the few that would follow you righteously, but for the most part, it's no different than today. The majority have their own idea of what righteousness is or what they feel is just in the way that we define just, not the way you define just. So help us as we read your and study your word that we would understand you and know you better, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me share out here the Bible. Oh, I'm sorry, the Bible. Uh, let's see here. There it is. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, now, as, as we saw, you know, like I said, we wrapped up last week uh, where Moses was telling the people. And remember, the people told Moses, hey, you speak to us. We will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. So Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. In other words, sin is rebellion against God, right? So if sin is rebellion against God, what Moses is saying to the people is God has the way to provide you guidance and direction so that you will not rebel against him. And that's what he's giving you today. He's giving you the way to walk in a way that pleases God and and oh, and exalts him and doesn't, you know, it doesn't end up putting you in a rebellious path toward him. So notice, so the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Now, they're talking about the, the cloud that was over Mount Sinai. That was the darkness, okay? So now moving from there, look what happens. We're going to verse 22 of uh, Exodus 20, and look what it says. Now look who God is speaking, to, is speaking to. And the Lord said to Moses, notice that it's no longer he's talking from the mountain to the people. So God said, okay, if that's what they want, then I'm going to talk to you, Moses. Now here's what God is telling them. Now he's amplifying on the Ten Commandments. He says, thus you shall say to the people of Israel, you have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. In other words, God is saying from his abode, he's, he has communicated directly with the people. They cannot question that now. They can't say it was Moses all along. 
they, without a doubt, know that it was God speaking to them directly. And they didn't like it. And so this is where they're at. But God wants them to understand that God has revealed himself to them. It's not just about Moses here. So he says, now notice what ends up happening. He goes back to the Ten Commandments. You shall not make gods. Now he's amplifying, right? You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. Well, we're going to see where that one comes back up again. But notice, now notice what he says. To be with me. In other words, he's saying, in other words, don't make me a stack of, yeah, go ahead, Milton. Yeah, my Bible says alongside of me. There you go. And that's what it's all about. It, it, whether you say to be with me or alongside of me, what he's saying is, I don't want to be one in a mix of gods. Right. I am the only one. I want you to see me as your only God, period. No yeah. other gods before me, right? And make no gods out of graven images or of creatures, anything like that. You see the issue? That's what God is referring to here. Because he knows there are many gods out there, the small G-O-D-S's, right? And he knows they've come out of Egypt where they, they apparently have become very liberal in their worship. And so God is saying, no, no, that's got to change. There is only going to be one God. And I am that God. And it fits with the first three commandments up there about God, okay? Now he says, part of your relationship with me comes up in 24. An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. Now notice he hasn't explained these different offerings or how they are to be yet, but the altar is the key here. The altar is the place of sacrifice. In, in our economy with God, everything that we do before God needs to be a sacrifice to him. If we fast, is fasting a sacrifice to God? Yes. Yeah. If we pray, is praying a sacrifice to God? Yes. Absolutely. If we sing or if we praise him, is that a sacrifice to God? No, that's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> amen amen but so it is. yeah go ahead Mel. it is yeah yeah so i mean i just hit a few but when you look at it anything we do that exalts god and says i am totally dependent on you guess what that is an act of sacrifice to god now notice in this case god was making something as a symbol to that sacrifice, the altar. The altar is important. There was nothing wrong with the altar. The problem was is how people ended up treating the altar, right? They ended up worshiping or looking to the altar instead of looking to who the altar was representing, who it was for, their God. Now notice what he says about the altar. Notice what they're to make it of. Earth. Right? Are they supposed to make it elaborately? Are supposed to are they supposed to build it up with nice, you know, quarried stones and make it all fancy? No. And he's saying, just make it out of earth. In other words, just put it there because I don't want there to be anything that makes you want to worship the altar instead of God. Make it so insignificant in the sense that it doesn't draw your attention. But you use it as a symbol to bring your sacrifice to God, not worship the altar. And we see that later where people really focus more on the altar than they focused on God. And that happens, because you'll see later, well, not in Exodus, but later on, you'll see that in Scripture where, I mean, the altar became so central to the worship that they were worshiping the altar more than they were worshiping God. So that's why God isn't saying make it all of this really grandiose thing because, hey, you're turning it into an idol if you start, you know, making it special. Look what he says. And but there's going to be offerings. There will be burnt offerings, which will be like for sin. And then there's going to be peace offerings, 
there that's for relationship building and where there may have been antagonism and they're going to use sheep and oxen but there are goats also that will come up but he's he's starting to lay the groundwork for what he later expounds on in terms of the different types of offerings or sacrifices that are given on the altar so he says in every place where i cause my name to be remembered i will come to you and bless you so what should they be doing if his name is going to be remembered in all these places if 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 well <laughs> that's because mm -hmm. we are human right yeah. <laughs> but what is the central part if they did do that what is it that the mandate really ends up saying in that sentence they're to offer offerings to him okay they meet where they go okay so do you think that some of these offerings are that they should witness about their god to the peoples where they go oh of course. you see what i'm saying so in essence, a lot of times when I look at this, I see so many places where they had just as much a mandate as we do to go out and spread the Great Commission, to go out and tell others about the good news. They had it too. But yet it seems like that part kind of got swept under the rug. But that was one of the things, because I mean, how is it that his name is going to be remembered? You got to go tell people. And wherever you tell people, there was this thing that as they told people, there was that, that you know, that chain of word being passed amongst people about God. That, that's how it would have been. So that, that's part of it, was they were to go tell others. They were to represent their God. And that would have been a sacrifice in terms of their giving, because they don't know how they would, the people were going to accept them telling about their God. But one of the things they had behind them was were the effects that God had already produced from Egypt on because these nations were already privy of those. So they already had a leg up and saying, hey, did you see what my God did in Egypt? Did you see what my God did to the Amalekites? Did you see what my God did at, at Sinai? Because, hey, the word was getting out about all these things. Yes, it was. So, in essence, they had a great testimony going for them. So, he's saying, and then when they do that, I will come to you and bless you. It was part of what God wanted to reflect as the unity between them and their God, that these are the things that they sacrificially would do to bring him honor and glory and reach out to the other people. Yeah. Plus, uh, as they moved on, these altars would be left and later on people could come by and say what are these stones and someone would say this is where the hebrews worship their god they exactly sacrificed here and you might say well i want to sacrifice to him too this was this was sort of the intent there you go anything that would cause them to focus on the one true god was yeah. essential yeah amen amen and through that he would bless them for that yeah. I mean, that's an awesome thing. So look at verse 25. Now, here's where he starts breaking down certain requirements. If they make, remember, the altar is to be made of earth. But look what he says here. If you make me an altar of stone, notice what he's saying. You shall not build it of hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. Why do you think God would say that? Becomes an idol. That's the that's the key right there. <laughs> Their idols were all hewn or molded or created by man in a certain way that brought attention to whatever it was that they made or they hewed out of stone. So God is saying, hey, if you're going to put me an altar out there, that's going to last longer than just an earth altar and you put stones, you it's OK to use stones, but don't make it into an don't make it into an idol don't hewn it don't do just use it to hold the sacrifice that's all you do and that was important hey you can make a pretty good altar that would last a long time with stone yes. without even hewing it yeah stack them up exactly so and like you said it would be there for a long time people could ask what's this 
there would be a, you know, a, a testimony about it. So that's why God is making it clear. Because what was with the other commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and you shall not make images of anything of creature basically and worship it as a god, right? Yes. So that's what he's saying. If you start hewning things, you're going to put images on those stones, and you're going to be worshiping the images. So don't do any of that. He knows their heart. <laughs> <laughs> So, verse 26, and you shall not go up by the steps of my altar, that your nakedness might be ex exposed on it. Why do you think, in that time, you would think that sexual immorality is the only thing that happens today? Why do you think this was important back then? They didn't have underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's a possibility. But anyway. <laughs> well, I don't know about the nakedness, but I know like the Lutheran church, there's steps going up to the altar. Oh, yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, when the tabernacle, when we get into the tabernacle, you'll see that, yeah, there are steps going up to that altar, too. You know, the one that God has them built. But the reason is this. <laughs> Sexual immorality was rampant back then. Yeah. But it was associated with all of these other gods. They had temple prostitutes. They had all these other issues. And what God is saying, I don't want you to be drawn away by sexual innuendo with worshiping me. My worship needs to be totally from the heart to me, not about any of the thing from these other gods and the way that they have included sexual lewdness and sexual impropriety as part of their worship to their God, small g-o-d God. You see what I'm talking about? And so he's saying, I don't want anything that gets in the way of your hearts being right before me to distract you and think there's something else going on. So you're not to do anything that in any way can distract you from your worship and sacrifice to me. That's why he makes that clear in this point. Because let me ask you a question. In Christianity, is there is there any propriety in sexual activity within the church? What do you mean by propriety? What does that word mean? It, right. Do, doing the right thing God's way. Oh, yeah. Marriage. Only way. That's right. Yeah. Only way. But even the married people don't do it out in the open. Right. You know what I'm saying? There is a way that meets God's requirements in terms of, you know, Genesis 2.24, right? Man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, they shall become one flesh. And then the requirement that God had levied with Adam is still in place, be fruitful and multiply. But it is be done within the context of that, that relationship between husband and wife. And that's what this is all about. See, there is a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. God's way is the way God wants it done, and sexuality is something that Satan has turned into a useful distraction from following God by many people. Why? Because God made it a strong drive in humankind, because like he told Adam, he wants mankind to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. So... Of course, if that's what God wants, he's going to make that a strong urge in the person and really make it something wonderful because that would, you know, cause mankind to be fruitful and multiply. But God had his way for it being carried out, not Satan's way. But Satan has used that throughout the whole world, throughout all the ages, and that's why we've always had problems with sexuality. Yeah. It's because... It's it's God made it a pleasant thing, but it can be misused. And and boy, has mankind misused sexual impropriety. Yeah, to the nth degree. To uh, the nth degree. Amen. Amen. Then and now hasn't changed. Yeah. No. So any questions so far up through verse 26? Okay. Well, you know what? It's already 725. Maybe we need to stop there. Um, uh, because 
we're going to, I mean, all of these are sections, okay? This part we've covered right now, cover, let's go up here and take a look at the Ten Commandments real quick, at the front end of the Ten Commandments. Here, and this is chapter 20. Look at what he says, starting in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. So what we studied today was there was their guidance on the issue of having no other gods before him? Yes. Yes. So see how he's expanded on it to give more guidance and direction in what he provided below to Moses? Notice what he says. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. What if they hewed the stone? Could they put a carved image on a hewn stone? Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water of the earth. Why do you think God would make this so pointed to these different images, to these different created beings? Those are visuals. That's right. They were visuals of the fact that those of these nations and peoples were worshiping these specific things. They were worshiping the creatures rather than the creator. See the issue? Oh, yeah. That's why he's being specific here about these kinds of things, because, hey, all these nations are turning these creatures into objects of worship, and they reflect, unfortunately, satanic beings. They reflect demons. They're worshiping demons is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. No. God's not happy with that. Mm -hmm. Now, look. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So God is just saying, look, I know you are all fallen. And I know that, you know, hey, you have a proclivity to sin. I know you're born in sin. That is who you are. But what I'm saying is this. There are consequences to the sin that you do carry in. I am the answer to give you strength over these problems of sin in your life. Now, in this case, he gave them the law to help them to identify those areas that they were falling short on, right? But in this case, he's saying, look, there is a a cost in terms of sinning it goes down to your generation sin carries from one generation to another guess what if your parents are doing it what are the chances that you might do it too That's very strong oh yeah if you look if you go even study social sciences today they make it clear that the children inherit the you know the ideas and strengths mainly come from their parents yeah. yes they get them from society but their primary source is their parents yeah so i mean that's why he's making it clear to them that hey if you live in this sin guess what you're just going to continue to propagate it down your generations because that's just all they know that's what they understand as being central well my dad did it my mom did it so yes i do it too that's what i thought when i was younger well, I think we all have, to be honest with you. I knew it wasn't me, but I thought, well, there's the way my family does, so I'm supposed to do it too. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. I mean, I think we've all experienced it at some level, some yeah. more than others. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So now notice verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who <clears> takes <throat> his name in vain. Like I explained when we went over this verse, taking his name in vain isn't just, you know, saying, uh, you know, a bad word using God's name. Taking God's name in vain, when we fear God, you know how, you know, the beginning of, of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, as Proverbs talks about. Uh, when you look at that, what you find is that in our relationship with God, fearing him means... <coughs> We care about everything that God does to rep and represent himself in us, okay? So what he's saying is that as we live for him, we are, we are being obedient 
to surrender to who he is and to his majesty, to his sovereignty. But when we don't live the way he wants us to, we are taking his name in vain if we use his name. In other words, there is no power behind. You know how we keep talking about that there's eternal security and salvation, right? You understand eternal security, that once saved, always saved. Now, I don't take that lightly, but in this case, what he's talking about here is that we, when we belong to him, in that case, the Hebrew people were the chosen people. In other words, they needed to represent God. Anything they did that didn't represent God wasn't just rebellious. It was taking God's name in vain because they were representing God, their God. God had said, these are my people based on the Abrahamic covenant through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when they did not live up to the values God had established for them, whether in the law or we'll see what all these values are, they were basically taking his name in vain, in rebellion. That's what sin is. Okay? Yeah. And we haven't gotten into... Uh, worshiping God on a specific date, but that's the next one, keeping the Sabbath day holy. But we didn't really get into that one as much as we kind of covered these first four, right? Or I mean the first three in yeah. the part that we just studied. So we'll get into that one when we, we'll talk about that one more when we get to where that one gets expanded out in terms of how we worship. Yeah. Yeah, and Paul covered that, uh, taking the Lord's name in vain in uh, Romans, the last part of 5 and verse chapter 6. That's it. Oh, or sin abounds, grace much more abounds. What shall we say then? Shall we sin more that we can get more grace? And he said, God forbid. God forbid. Because that's taking God's name in vain. Amen. Uh, taking God as your God and living for yourself and the world is taking God's name in vain. That's it. That's it. Yeah, a lot of times, because when I was brought up, I was always brought up to say, oh, if you say GD, boy, yeah. you have really taken God's name in vain. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, that was the definition of taking God's name in vain. Right. That's, and But it's a lot deeper than that. Yeah. It's yeah. a life. It's your life. It's, our, it's who we are. We are to reflect him. Right. Amen. Since we are his, yeah. we need to reflect him as he is. Yeah, in we're our life. Taking his name. Amen. Us. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So that's our lesson tonight. Any questions, comments, agreements, disagreements, corrections? I caught myself looking out the window listening for a trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell you what, you go look at what John talked about in those last verses of Revelation 22. Come, Lord Jesus, come would be a good thing. Hey, man. <laughs> We've been listening for 45 years. <laughs> been looking in the clouds, too. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. He says it's not, not time yet. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Today would be a good day. Hey, yeah. I'm with you, Mary. I'm with you. I think we probably all are. <laughs> Yes. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, that's our lesson for this evening. But as we get into all of this explanation and expanding on what God's law is, you'll find you'll find good guidance in terms of who we are to be even today. Now, remember this. And man, no matter how much how many days we're going to be on this whole area of laws and regulations and rules they are not what make our relationship with jesus christ remember that god is not a god of legalism he's not a god of performance value it's not like god is up there you, you've probably heard pastors say this with his checklist okay what did mary do today <laughs> she did she pray Oh, she only prayed once. Uh, well, I'll give her half a point for that. Um, did she? I did wake up with a song in my heart. Oh, you just got a double point for that one. See? <laughs> I, mean, <there. laughs> I was but, in a lot of pain during the night. And so I said, oh, wow. just let me wake up with a 
a with, song. with a song in your heart. And he did. Amen. Amen. But you see what I'm talking about? You see how we, as human beings, though, are very much performance-based, aren't we? Yeah. If you're going to go get a job, what is it that you take in with you? Your resume. A res resume. What's a resume? How good you are. A no. performance Don't report. Don't put the bad stuff on there. <laughs> well, it's a lying performance. I mean, a performance report on what you've done, right? Yeah. Or at least what you want them to believe you've done, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's because that's what we are and we tend to put god in that same box we tend to think that god is just like us in that respect yeah but he's not god's grace goes beyond performance some might say well wait a minute ephesians 2 10 that says that god has prepared good works for us to do from before time basically you know mm -hmm. so if he's put these good works in place isn't that because he's performance-based? No. Just like we're studying with the Hebrews, it wasn't about their performance that God was looking for. He put those in place so that they could see their need for him <clears throat> because of the fact that they would have trouble being able to live up to him. Did God know that they weren't going to be able to keep the law when he made it? Yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Look how much they were already dogging God on the way down from Egypt. <laughs> and grumbling and complaining and everything else, right? In spite of all that God had done. So do you think then God knows, and I've already said this before, when Jesus saved you, when you cried out to him and said, Lord Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I accept you with my heart. I surrender, I repent my sins, and I accept you were risen again from the dead by our Lord and God. And now I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Do you think God went to the book of works? You know that it talks about in Revelation chapter 21 at the great white throne judgment or, you know, and and he was looking through to see, uh, let me see Ted here, man. Don't see much. <laughs> He's only got three three items here. I thought he'd have three pages. Do you think God looked at that and said, I don't know about this Ted guy? Not at all. Not even close. He just said, thank you for coming to me. Because those who come to me, I will what? <clears throat> In no, no wise, wise cast out. Cast out. Isn't that an amazing promise? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, so for each of us, yeah, Milton. He couldn't get to the books because the angels were dancing around having a party when you came to the Lord. That's it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> I'll too. tell you, I think there was a super party for me. They're like, Ted, seriously? Hey, go on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, I mean, hey, there's a party for everyone that comes to saving grace in heaven. That's amazing. That's amazing. So that's what we're looking at. That's what we're working toward. And we can see the parallels from what God was doing with the Hebrews and what he does with us today or what he wanted the Hebrews to understand and come to then and what he does to us through, uh, through Jesus Christ today. It really was no different. It was just a different focus and a different tact. But the bottom line is we can see that if we try to live by directions and, and guidance, we're going to fail because we can't. We're, if we try to be performance-based, we're going to fail. But if we be surrendered to God, it's going to work. Because he, by grace, forgives us. He, by grace, is our Redeemer, who we know, as Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, as the pastor was saying recently in his messages, right? Yeah, and he performs through us. He works through us, absolutely. And that's what we surrender to him for, is that he will use us as a vessel worthy of his use. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Good? Well, Ted, yeah, go ahead. I think you have more than three pages now. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm up to a page and a half by now. Yeah, I think more than that. Oh, you think so? Wow, <laughs> thank you, Janice. Hey, Lord, listen to Janice. <laughs> <laughs> All that you do for people, Ted, uh, well, you do a lot. Yeah. 
hey, it's all because of what God does, you know, through yeah. me. It's like, you know, because when you really realize it in our hearts, you know, just as you all know, you know your shortcomings, don't you? Uh, we don't tell people those things, but we know where we fall short. We know those areas that we struggle with in our walk with the Lord. And yet God says, I got you, Ted. You know, I'm still with you. And I will be there for you. All you have to do is just come before me and mm -hmm. basically just humble yourself before me. That's all he's saying. And he's there to forgive us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The first John 1, 9 thing, right? We confess our sins to him. Now, did we confess already at saving grace? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Were, we, were we already forgiven at saving grace? Yes. Yes, for every single solitary sin that we would ever commit. But the reason we confess our sins to him is because we need to be aware of our shortcomings. Because guess what? We work with him. He works with us and through us. And so we need to be aware of those areas where the Holy Spirit is doing a better and a greater work in us to get us free from those areas of sin. As we grow in him, guess what? God, when he takes us away from a deeper sin, a more problematic sin, guess what? You, you would think that that's the one that I really need to finally deal with and I'll be okay. <laughs> but as soon as that one is dealt with, God deals with that one in our lives. Guess what? We just couldn't see over that one. And all that other multitude that is on the other side, it's like, yeah, uh, Lord, I hope you haven't backed off any. We got some serious work to do now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We've all dealt with it. Yeah. And it's just who we are. But I'll tell you, the Bible makes it so clear that God is always faithful. Even when we fall short in our faithfulness, he never does. And he's always there with us. That's a great promise. Okay, we ready for prayer time? Yeah. Okay, and let's stop the recording here.